from past 4.5 year, uh, years in VBDN Technologies. So when I started my journey, so I joined here uh, as a fresher from my college. Uh, I placed here. So I joined here as a uh, intern. So the, at that time I was working in the uh, NOC team. Uh, NOC team uh, stands for like uh, network operations uh, management team. So there we were monitoring uh, the production environments, production servers, these things on various monitoring tools like uh, AppDynamics, CloudWatch, Zebex. So these I have worked on. Then I moved to the CloudOps team. So there my role and roles and responsibilities were to manage the infrastructure on AWS Cloud. So there we were managing uh, the uh, all the AWS servers. There were 1500 plus servers present on the AWS. So we were managing like we were deploying the codes. Uh, if any new deployment came uh, using various deployment methods like blue green or canary. Similarly, like uh, we were doing the patching uh, of the servers to secure our systems, uh, like patching more OS vulnerabilities, business vulnerabilities, these things. So at that time I was working with AWS. Then at that time, like when we when we were deploying the code, so deployment was done using the Jenkins uh, Jenkins, and it was uh, included in that. Then after one year, I was moved to the uh, DevOps team. So there, my roles and responsibilities were to uh, automate uh, our infrastructure, whatever we are, uh, whatever task we are doing on day to day basis, manually. So there, we were uh, like automating the things using Ansible. Uh, apart from this, we were written Python Python scripts to automate this. Then uh, recently, I was doing the project for disaster recovery. Like if any of the AWS environment or AWS region went down. Down. So how we we'll, uh, keep our things running in another another region. So for that we we are using Terraform. Okay, awesome, very impressive uh, profile, um, I would say. Uh, so this is your first company where you are working. You said you joined yes. as an intern. Okay. Yes, yes. And overall, how many years of experience you have? Four point five, same. Uh, Four point five years. And you did yeah. your graduation in computer science or which stream? IT. IT. OK, cool. Yeah. So everything on the resume is uh, you understand that you have prepared, I believe, yourself. Yes, yes, yes. OK, <clears throat> so uh, which uh, which DevOps tools uh, are you comfortable? You mentioned a bit of Jenkins, then uh, move to uh, cloud, a lot of cloud monitoring you mentioned. Yes. Any any Terraform, uh, Terraform Ansible. Uh, apart from this containerization part, I have worked on Docker as well as Kubernetes. But Kubernetes, I have done uh, like that, that much on hands-on experience. I don't have because there is no project in my current company. But uh, for the learning purpose, I did the certification as well for Kubernetes. Okay. Yeah, I see that you have done. Uh, three exams as well. Yes, yes. Did you find them difficult? These. Uh... No, like professional AWS certified solution architect professional was little bit difficult uh, because it comes with uh, more more with the costing part as well. So that was little bit difficult. But apart from uh, this, these two, uh, these are OK. OK, did you use any um, any dumps or anything? How did you prepare these for these exams? Yeah, so I prepared uh, from Udemy uh, courses. So in my company, like they provided us the Udemy credentials and the uh, courses. So there uh, in the uh, Udemy courses itself, there are the practice labs. So we practiced from those labs and the documentation as well in the, uh, you know, in the CK certified Kubernetes administrator in the exam itself, they are uh, like allowing us to open the documentation of the Kubernetes. Right. Yeah, so yeah, so we, we can like easily manage that. Also, uh, before that, we did the hands on practice labs to practice for the exam. Awesome. Very good. I'll stop sharing this. And uh, I want to understand this monitoring part uh, first because you probably have worked extensively on the monitoring side. So yes. uh, what is this like? Give me some idea like why do we need so close monitoring and uh, which kind of monitoring did you work on? Was it 
something okay. out of the box or were you yeah. also involved in log monitoring etc mm -hmm. okay so like when we are having 1500 i was telling you that we were managing 1500 plus servers and all were the production servers so when coming to the production server, so we have to keep close watch whether uh, all these systems like our, our systems sh should be up and running and there should not be any downtime. So we should mon man uh, like monitor our servers very closely. So we were using the server level monitoring firstly on the CloudWatch, but CloudWatch has, is having some, a, a CloudWatch is a service of AWS, so CloudWatch is having some limitations. Like it is, it is not giving us the memory metrics. Apart from this, if we want to monitor uh, the response time of our uh, of our APIs like uh, application level monitoring, so that things are also not given by uh, CloudWatch. So on the CloudWatch, we were just monitoring the CPU utilization, disk utilization. Apart from this, if the servers are healthy or not, only these type of monitoring we can do using the CloudWatch. With, with the CloudWatch agent, you can always. Yes, yes, but uh, we we can uh, you monitor the using the CloudWatch agent, but uh, in that case, we have to install CloudWatch agent on all the instances. So the that, that was a little to... bit. Okay. How yes. did you overcome this? Uh, so we we went on to this. Uh, look, we looked. We were looking for the solutions. So we found one open source monitoring tool, Zabbix. So on the Zabbix tool, uh, in that case as well, we have to install the Zabbix agent on the servers. Yes. So, but uh, we were, uh, but from that as well, we were only getting the memory metrics, but not the API level monitoring. So then we went to uh, this uh, app dynamics. So on the app dynamics, we have the clear picture of all the like from where database is connecting to the servers and how this Redis clusters are connecting to the servers. Everything we are we are getting the picture of our. So, so what is the difference between these tools? Do you understand why why these uh, yes. tools are different and? Uh, yes, like uh, in in the uh, we can say in the metrics level, like we can monitor more uh, infrastructure on these tools. So on the app dynamics, I can say that uh, we can monitor many things. Like uh, we can monitor our database metrics as well on the app dynamics. Apart from this, uh, each and every API which is calling inside inside uh, between application between front end and the back end. Like you can say, if we are having one API slash login while logging into the first page, so that uh, API level monitoring we can do over the app dynamics. Also, if the response time or if someone is getting the error, so that kind of uh, that level of monitoring we can do using app dynamics also we can uh, integrate many other tools with app dynamics let's say pager duty so to get the calls over the phone if something went down so we can get the calls over the over our phones or the emails so that we have integrated with app dynamics apart from this uh, but one more thing we didn't find in app dynamics that was the uh, uptime monitoring uptime monitoring is let's suppose we have one site www.inside.netgear.com uh, let's say so for that if we want that this uh, page should be up and running uh, like 24 to 7 so this type of monitoring we cannot do using app dynamics so for that we were using the pingdom monitoring so what pingdom is doing pingdom is having probe servers at, at different different location and different different countries so from there pingdom is uh, like uh, uh, pushing some uh, we can say load on the on this website URL and in that way it is searching that whether we are getting the correct response code or not. So there we can this type of monitoring we are using the uh, using pingdom also from the pingdom we can use uh, we can uh, monitor transactional monitoring like let's suppose if our site is having working like login page then uh, add to cart button and then check out or the payment method we have in the in our website so we can uh, do that as well on the pingdom like pingdom will click on the login uh, login button then it will check for the credentials then it will uh, like add the products to the cart and it will go for the billing part so it will check everything so we can write a small share script or the bash script inside the pingdom and uh, pingdom will execute that script after like whatever interval we have set like 30 seconds or the 60 seconds as per our response time of the site so in that way pingdom we are using okay two, two questions uh, first question is do you understand the difference between these tools why you had to do four or five tools uh yes like uh, when we were implementing one tool, so there were some limitations, but uh, at the end we have. Why is that limitation? Why did AWS not implemented what App Dynamics has implemented in their tool? 
so now uh, like at, at that time aws was started in i think 2006 uh, or 2007 so at that time i think the resources uh, that much level of uh, you can say expertise was not was not there so i think that time it was not there but now i can say that after uh, this aws is also giving uh, api level monitoring but we have to set some custom metrics and dashboards okay so one one thing that i can add here is that these are different types of tools that you mentioned one is infrastructure yes. monitoring it this yes. app dynamics falls into application performance uh, yes. monitoring. monitoring so yes. that's why aws is not into this to that extent even though you can do log monitoring and all through cloudwatch as well right, right. but how did you do, uh, like how did you enable app dynamics in your environment so for that there are multiple agents for app dynamics which is provided by app dynamics itself so to uh, monitor the server level uh, metrics like the cpu memory disk whatever the process is running on the servers so these type of monitoring we can uh, do using the machine agent so app this machine agent is provided by app dynamics only so we have to install the machine agent on, on our systems similarly application monitoring uh, is done by uh, app dynamics using the app application agent so there are multiple application agent given by uh, this app dynamics if our application is running on php so it is giving php agent if it is running on java so uh, app dynamics is giving us the java uh, application agent so we have to integrate it with our systems with the right agent yes any any log monitoring uh, experience you have yes and so log monitoring we are uh, using cloudwatch as well as graylog so for the gray log uh, like cloudwatch is uh, we have integrated with our ecs systems which are running on the ecs service dockerized so for that we are using cloudwatch but for the ec2 level like to view everything uh, on the dashboard centralized dashboard so for that we are using gray log so for gray log uh, there is one uh, file uh, there is one log shipper to be present on the system that is filebeat so we have installed file filebeat as a service on all our systems and uh, that uh log monitoring we can do using the gray log sure. and how did you install these uh, onto so many uh, 1500 servers using ansible okay so can you explain a bit bit of uh, yes. overview of how your folder structure looks in ansible yes so uh, there is no as such folder structure in ansible like we are using ansible tower that is again a centralized dashboard from where we can run our jobs so uh, what we did is like uh, we have first we written a uh, ansible job to fetch all the ec2 details like ec2 details in all the aws in aws accounts so that we can get the ips of the instances because again we, if we are doing the ssh or if we want to install anything on the server we need the ip How, how, how would ansible get all the instances in an aws account uh, right so for that we need to configure the either the roles iam roles like the ansible server is again present in our one of our aws account right. with that with that ansible server we have the connectivity with all the servers via vpc peering if the uh, if the instances are in different uh, in different vpc or in different aws accounts again one on the single uh, ansible server we have associated the cross account roles present to fetch the ec2 details that ensures Then connectivity use... from your ansible uh, server, server to all to your other instances servers. right and right. then you can tell it that uh, these are the ip addresses of but you you are saying it it will do auto discovery right yes auto discovery also we have to write the playbook as well to fetch the instance level detail connectivity is there but it will not automatically fetch the ips of the servers so there is there are some ansible modules inbuilt on ansible modules like ec2 info so AWS we use that modules. module aws modules yes so using those modules we can uh, like it will give the output in the json json's format so we can fetch those uh, values in our csv so we write uh, like the ansible script to fetch the ip details and the server is in running state or the stop state these these things we put in the csv then uh, one, one, using one those question. sorry one question sure. here so no ans there is ansible tower it will be able to fetch it's able to connect to those servers maybe in one account how will it know across accounts 
No, so cross account, what we are doing, uh, the cross account role is we are just giving the trusted entity, like the account a trusted entity is a policy which will give the account name, like on which accounts it can trust. So we have to give the account ID of in that policy, like for which uh, servers we have to connect. This policy in which account? This policy is associated with the role which is uh, which is present on the, which is uh, associated with the Ansible server. Okay, cool. Okay, next then we did auto discovery after that. Uh, yes, so we put the we, we put complete EC2 details in the CSV file. Then in the CSV file, we have all the details of EC2 like EC2 name, uh, instance name, instance ID, instance IP, as well as instance, uh, what we can say instance state, if it is a running state or stop state, because on the stop servers, we cannot able to SSH onto the server, so we will not be able to install uh, these things. So after uh, after we get the IP details, so we put these IP details in the inventory of the Ansible. So that Ansible can uh, do the SSH one by one and we put uh, like some groups like these are the non prod server IPs and these are the prod server IPs or if they are project wise. So we put the uh, groups like project like this is our uh, project A IPs and these are our project this B IPs. This you manually do in the Ansible tower. Yes, yes. There is a, do you know there's an automated way of connecting this tower and with your inventory file? Yes, there is an automated way, but we have to, again we have to sync those files manually. Like we can put these files on the GitHub and we can con configure Git in the Ansible tower. And uh, using the sync, uh, there is one option of projects there we can sync our Git with Ansible. So again, but we have to put the file in the GitHub as well manually. Awesome, very good. So uh, you said Ansible, we covered uh, we covered the monitoring part of it. Uh, containerization. I'm I'm sure since you are certified, you you would know, right? Uh, usually the containers are very uh, can be unstable and can be short lived. So mm -hmm. how do we ensure that you know some sort of state that container is maintaining how do we save some data and all okay so uh, in the containerization part we are using the ecs which is again a managed service of aws so there we have put the auto scaling on container level as well and the instance level as well so if the load increases or if the CPU utilization increases. So we have set up the dynamic scaling policies on auto scaling. Like if the CPU utilization, uh, we have put dynamic policy in such a way that if let's say suppose CPU utilization is greater than 70% of, of any of the EC2 instance. So instance automatically should comes up uh, using the auto scaling policy. So uh, like uh, we never faced, uh, we never gone into that situation that instance never came up or uh, there is a downtime. So it, it, it also the uh, when we are using the ECS, so there is always a ECS agent, uh, pre, uh, ECS agent automatically uh, running on the each and every instance, which ensures that the container should be up and running. And uh, like let's suppose if ECS went down, so we have configured ECS agent went down, so we have configured ECS agent in such a way that uh, like whenever it went down, so the process automatically start up. Yes, but any any state file, any information that container is processing, uh, where do you suggest it should be kept so that it can be either picked up by the subsequent container if it goes unhealthy? How do we store the state of a container? So this is the task definition. In the task definition of the ECS, we put these uh, these policies like how many tasks should be up and running on an in instance. Also, uh, we can set the memory limits and CPU limits as well that after uh, after one container reaches the limit, then another container should come up. OK, OK, but that again does not explain how where it would store the state of any container. Uh, I think it automatically ECS agent automatically monitors this. OK. So there must be some some sort of storage where it, it would store, right? Mm. Anything around um, volumes? Do you do you know what? Uh, what yeah, Docker volumes. 
Docker volumes you are asking. So, oh, yeah, Docker volumes. Yeah, yeah. What, what are Docker volumes? So, in the Docker volumes, our complete, uh, we can say complete uh, details regarding the container uh, is stored, or whatever the data we are uh, storing inside that, that is being stored over there. So, uh, but I don't think that we can, if the container went down or something, like we can associate the Docker volume uh, with any other container. I don't think we can do so. But yeah, with the same uh, configuration, a new container can come up. So, uh, Right. So, so if if just to correct, like if the volume is on uh, EFS or some storage where it is persisted, the next oh. container can actually pick it up from there. Yes, either the EBS volume or the EF EFS. Right. Okay. I'm just going through your uh, profile. Any uh, GitLab uh, experience? No, GitLab, I don't have no on. Any uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, so mainly you have been managing these servers uh, uh, and, and also the application on top of them. Any any DevSecOps kind of experience, any security experience? Yes, yeah, so, so security purpose like we have used recently, I uh, configured uh, AWS network firewall on our system to manage our egress traffic from the servers. What so, is egress? In, what is egress? Egress is the egress is nothing but our outgoing traffic which is going out from the servers. Okay. So that is known as the egress traffic. So we are controlling our egress traffic. Like uh, if we want to, if we want our server to go on, uh, like to ping Google.com, then only it will ping. Otherwise not. So we have restrict our servers to go out outside. Okay. So that we did using AWS Network Firewall and the Suricata rules. What is that? So uh, Suricata rules. So Suricata is uh, uh, like we can say open source uh, tool which is creating the rules, multiple types of rules based on. Uh, so AWS Network Firewall is uh, like re uh, reading those rules and as per the rules, uh, it is restricting our traffic. So there are there can be multiple uh, terms in Suricata like fast rules, alert rules, drop rules. So uh, according to the drop rules, the traffic will be blocked. And if we are creating the pass rules on top of that, if the pass rule is present for uh, the Google.com, then only our servers will be able to connect to Google.com. Okay. And uh, any kind of uh, security product in the application build deployment uh, process security product we have used we are using one crowdstrike falcon agents mm -hmm. and uh, one more tenable uh, agents tenable is uh, the product of nessus so what tenable is doing tenable is running on all the servers uh, again it is a agent so what it is doing it is uh, fetching all the vulnerability details like uh, for which like uh, let's suppose if python version is running and it is uh, end of life so it is detecting and it is giving us the information like you have to uh, update uh, your patches or if you have to update your python version mm -hmm. then uh, our team is doing uh, like fixing those vulnerabilities as well Uh, and and where is your uh, uh, source code stored? So source code is inside the GitHub only, but uh, those source code repositories we don't have. We DevOps team don't have the access. When we are just giving when, whenever we have to do the deployment. So Dev team uh, application team is giving us uh, the uh, what we can say the GitHub URL that you have to clone this repo and you have to do the deployment. Okay. And how do you do the application deployments? Yeah, so application deployments, we are uh, like the dev team is again, the dev team is giving us the uh, like GitHub URL and we are doing it using the Jenkins. But at the application, then this at the infrastructure level, we are following blueprint deployment for the uh, servers which are running on EC2. And for the containerization deployment, we are uh, using uh, Canary deployment. We are following Canary deployment. Is, it, is, is Jenkins a right tool for doing deployments onto? How many how many applications do you have to manage? Like we have around uh, 10, 12, 12 plus applications. But is, is Jenkins the right tool for that? Uh, actually, from the beginning itself, uh, it is configured. So we are using Jenkins as of now. 
So how does it do? Jenkins has the SSH keys to connect to the servers and. Yeah. Yes, SSH keys to connect. OK, what other options would you suggest? Because you are anyway uh, so advanced on Ansible and you using Ansible Tower. Have you guys explored any other option to replace Jenkins? No, actually not till yet not. We have not replaced that, but uh, like uh, there was a uh, there was a limitation that key uh, key can be like uh, key is not the right option to configure on Jenkins. But uh, after every three months, we are rotating the keys using Ansible only. But uh, like that is a little bit uh, kind of security as well that keys are being rotated. But yes, Jenkins is not uh, that right way. We can use Bitbucket as well to deploy our codes. But as of now, again, we are using Jenkins. That is again the management decision. Okay. Okay. Do you mind explaining any any production event that you have managed any? Uh, outage or anything recently that has uh, that has happened uh, production outage actually uh, in the database time uh, in the database and we are using one aria uh, database so that is the third party so we are using that uh, as per the application so they recently what went is like the, Sorry, that that aria third party uh, aria. database third party third party database yeah that is aria why why do so, we use that uh, actually, uh, in the when when it, AWS was there, when we configured our system in, uh, systems initially, so at that time uh, RDS was not giving that uh, much capability. So that time the project uh, requirement was to explore some new database. Uh, actually, I don't remember the features of ARIA actually, but they are using that uh, third party database which is configured within our systems uh, okay. within our EC2s. Okay. So the outage was not with the AWS end. The outage was there with the ARIA end. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we uh, created the replicas at that time. So ARIA went down. Actually, the downtime was only for the five minutes. We tried to uh, like we tried to up our system. So what we did is like we created some replicas uh, in the ARIA end, and we tried to like whatever the main main data we have we try to install on our rda systems and connect with them but till then the area was uh, like again up so uh, but we have to we are looking for some solution that we can configure those databases on our systems only because it is uh, like not good that database is outside uh, third party and it can be down for any time so and, and you don't remember why you selected that product no, actually, when I joined this, so the, these projects were already set up. Now we are doing some modifications, optimizations in this infra. Any any recommendations towards optimization that you suggested uh, over the, all these four four and a half years? Yes. So recently, AWS launched the Graviton instances, which is giving higher performance uh, performances, uh, and in the cost part, it is giving forty percent discounts on the. Uh, old instance types. So we moved our all the instances on the Graviton instance type. So which, which, which is, instance were you using previously? Uh, so previously we were using uh, these uh, Intel instances. Okay. So now we are we have moved to uh, the Graviton types. So which is uh, like 40 percent cheaper than the older. Similarly smart choice, uh, right? on the EBS. That's sorry. a very smart choice, right? Like why would you not want to save 40 percent? Sorry, I, I, I said it's a very smart choice of selecting something cheaper when you know yeah. why would someone not want to use Graviton? Uh, so, so I, I'm just right. OK, OK, no, so Graviton is giving like a same uh, per, like performance wise. It is very good uh, mm -hmm. as per AWS. So performance wise, throughput wise, also uh, like there are some hardware maintenance activities going on on AWS. So for the Graviton instance types, they, these are being automatically managed. These don't we do not have to do anything on that. Apart from this, like uh, yeah, on the cost part, it is cheaper. So uh, we did this recently. 
Apart from this, like there is one more thing, uh, EPS volume. As you know that root volume as EPS is associated on all the instances. So previously, uh, there was the we were using the EPS volume GP2 general purpose tool. Now AWS launched GP3. So GP3 is uh, very good in throughput and performance wise is also very good. So and it is then again cheaper than the GP2. So we used uh, we moved our volumes to GP3. Okay, two questions now from this. Uh, how did you do it uh, moving GP2 to GP3 on so many servers? Again, uh, using Ansible. To Ansible, okay, you will update the playbook and. Uh, yes, uh, writing the playbook and in the IAM rule, we have to give the permissions to update the volumes. And because in the past, we were just fetching the details. So at that time, only read only permissions were required. But now we have to modify something on the AWS infra, so we have to give it some right permissions. But so this we will give... create issue, right? This you move from GP2 to GP3, there will be an outage. No, no, there was no downtime. We checked first, we tested first on the non-prod environments, and uh, then we moved to the production environments. There is no outage associated with this. Right, right. And uh, the second question was related to Graviton migration. So. How did you research about this this being a cheaper option and why why not everyone on AWS migrates to Graviton then? Oh, uh, actually, uh, we are having uh, we are using the enterprise uh, uh, AWS infrastructure. Like we have taken the AWS enterprise support. support. So yes, so we are having uh, weekly calls with AWS management and uh, the AWS stamps when account manager is associated with uh, our organization. So we have the calls on that. So they recommended us to do so. Then we then we did the research that whether it will uh, like it will not affect on our infrastructure or it will not give us bad impact on our infrastructure so, so we these all the that... recommendations are gp2 to gp3 and graviton is what aws usually recommends to their customers uh yes so but they did want... you have to make any code changes as well for migrating the application no no, no. we didn't did any code changes it migrated straight away yes but uh, when we are changing the instance type, so we have to stop. We have to stop the systems. Then mm -hmm. only we can change the instance type. Without stopping the instance, we cannot change the instance types. So that time we have to like uh, like we had to follow some approach that we can uh, do this activity without downtime. Because GP2 to GP3 we can do right away. But to migrate the instance type, we have to take some options. So we uh, like. Uh, we what we did uh, we did this ap activity application wise and we completed this activity around in three months so uh, what we did we created some parallel infrastructure using the existing amis then migrate and if it is non prod so we directly uh, like which do not have that that much impact for those servers so we did directly but uh, for those server which is having the production impact so those servers we did uh, like using some following some uh, strategies like uh, having the parallel infrastructure up and running, then testing on that infrastructure, whether it is working fine or not, then stop the existing infrastructure and doing the DNS cutover. So in that way, we did this. Awesome. Uh, and uh, you are managing or you are part of the discussions with the AWS TAM? Yes. OK, and, and who else um, represents from your company? So in our uh, DevOps team, we have 50 people. So uh, in 50 people, we have four leads. So I am one of them. So we four leads have to have to be present with uh, the AWS stamps. Apart from this, uh, from the client end as well, there are two people which are uh, like working with us only. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, they are also present on that. So we six people should be present on those calls. Okay, and and like these are. AWS recommended changes. Any any improvement that you have brought in uh, of late? Yes, yes. So uh, one, two, three services we are using from AWS. Like one is Trusted Advisor and Security Hub. Again, so, TAM, se TAM suggested. No, no. These are not TAM suggested. Uh, okay. These are uh, like we have to enable them, and uh, these uh, services. What these services are doing? These services are uh, like analyzing our our infrastructure and checking what is wrong in our infrastructure and what is right. Like if 
recently we have many lambda functions present in our aws account so for that node.js older version was deprecated node.js 12.x is deprecated now so that security hub and trust advisor they are giving us the findings that your lambda functions are reaching eol and uh, so similarly like elastic cache versions are uh, eol now so you have to update these systems so we did we are working on those findings as well to increase our security hub scores okay okay good that's good usually aws recommends that and either the lead or the team lead usually in the organizations look at these reports and have good understanding of uh, what's happening uh, yes, but does that mean you are still hands on? You are working, or are you just most of these discussions is what you are managing? And which is your strongest hands on uh, language, or uh, where you can code something? So regarding the code, like I didn't get the chance to uh, on the coding part when I joined, but uh, like I have worked on the Python scripting as well. So on the Python, I can say that I can work on. And Terraform, Ansible. Yeah, Terraform, Ansible, I can write. Can you pull a notepad and share your screen and see if you can write some? Yeah. Just share your screen and that notepad. OK. Uh, see if you can uh, write a hello world ansible playbook okay and just just keep explaining what what you are doing so we understand uh, sure so this is the host like uh, where we have to run this playbook okay so currently i'm giving the local host so it means that it will it can run uh, if the ansible is installed on our system so it will be run on our local so it we can run this playbook on the local system if we if we have to run this code on any other system so we can give here uh, like remote location or the inventory file where we have to run where our ips are placed so this is used for the uh, code where we have to run this now coming to the task like what task we have to run here we have to give the name of the task like like suppose printing hello world Let's say we have two servers and we have to run this on two remote servers. Mm -hmm. How would you go about? So, so in this we have to uh, give host as uh, our uh, inventory name, and this inventory should be placed somewhere, like uh, either in the same uh, path where this uh, Ansible where uh, Ansible script we are keeping. So we have to uh, put in the inventory file. We can create uh, if let's suppose this is, is this is my inventory file. So inventory file is having the extension CFG inventory configuration, and here we have the groups. Like let's suppose we have the non-prod group. So here we can place our IP. Let's suppose 172.29.21.1.1. Thirty-two. Let's suppose. So, and again the same. I uh, another IP is thirty-three. So, and if we have another group, broad. That's fine. I, I got the idea. I, 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 yeah. I so get some idea. So can yeah. we write something in Terraform? Say, uh, Terraform plus. So how will you connect your Terraform to your Ansible? Have you done that use case? Terraform with Ansible, no. I like as in Terraform. using using Ansible as a provisioner or no. yeah, like so like Terraform creates Terraform. an EC two and then Ansible takes over and deploys some application components. No, no, I haven't done this, but Terraform uh, we are using for uh, like provisioning our infrastructure, but not with uh, the Ansible. 
No, that's fine because you are using Ansible Tower. Maybe that's the reason. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Maybe I'm just guessing. Yeah. So, how can you like? Can you show us some Terraform experience? How how you maybe to create a bucket? Mm -hmm. So uh, here we have to give the uh, firstly we have to create the providers.tf file and uh, in the providers.tf we have to give the uh, like which provider we are using like let's suppose AWS we are using so we have to create first providers.tf file and in this we have to give the uh, actually the keywords I'm not uh, remembering it so because we are following the Terraform documentation always to uh, check for. The providers we can use AWS. Here we have to pass, if we are using the AWS credential, so we have to pass AWS secret key and access keys. Okay. Is it a right approach to uh, put access key and secret key in the code? No, 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 this is not the right approach. We can uh, encrypt these as well, but uh, we can if the Terraform, if we have the separate Terraform server, so we can again use the roles, IAM roles we can use. But if we are, how are you running this? So we have the Terraform server from where we are running this and uh, we, we can use like uh, in uh, in my scenario we are using the Jenkins on top of Terraform. So we have written one Python script uh, which will trigger uh, the Terraform scripts. So that is the Jenkins machine on our all our uh, this Terraform scripts are present. But how will the Terraform script access the AWS secret key and access key? No, so in that case, we are not using uh, the secret keys and access keys. Also, region we are not managing from here, but uh, we are using the roles. Like role will role role we are create uh, like if we give the permissions in the role that it should create the EC2 instance, then only it will create the EC2 instance. Otherwise, not. So who who gets that role? We only created the role. If we require you that, the role, uh, but who do you assign it to? How? Uh, means I'm not getting. Uh, I, I'm still not sure how you connect your Terraform code to AWS. So the, OK, so this so you have created machine. a role which says say you have administrative permissions, but mm -hmm. how will the Terraform get that role still is a challenge, right? So uh, OK, so this Terraform is running again on the EC2 instance. And that EC2 instance is having the role associated, which is having the, these many permissions. All right. Good. So this I was the providers. That's OK. We, we okay. got some idea. Uh, okay. Now maybe some last question. Like what is your motivation to quit this? This is a very nice place, right? You are getting exposure to all the tools, technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, any specific motivation you see uh, for you to Leave. Yeah, so there is uh, like not having any uh, issue with the work related, but uh, having issue with the night shifts. They are now they want now they want us to do the night shifts because some of our customers are US based and uh, they whenever they're like, you know that their uh, timings are different. So like there are uh, around 12.5 hours difference between our timings. Mm -hmm. So they want us to do the night shifts from the office. But my parents are not allowing me to go do the night shifts uh, from office actually. And also also I am also having some concerns regarding the night shifts, but and they are not uh, doing that. So that's why I have to look for the change. OK, so does that mean you I are mean, not flexible you... if some arrangement has to be required then? Uh, like they are not uh, giving us that. Uh, flexibility that you can do even if they can give us that you can do work from home, uh, but you have to do in the night shift, but they are not allowing us. So that's why I have to look for that change. Okay. No, fair, yeah. fair enough. You have your own priorities. So, yeah. Yes. No worries. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much I wanted to cover. Uh, uh, do you have any questions? You, you would have already received the job description and all. So uh, do you have yes. any questions? Uh, no, uh, I don't have any questions in that. Uh, I don't know. That's it. Cool then. Uh, 
then if you don't have questions, then we'll close the discussion and I will share the feedback. OK, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good day. You too. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.